Hello and welcome to another live edition of What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and joining me tonight is, of course, Father William Jenkins. He is a traditional Catholic priest. He's a member of the Society of St. Pius V. He's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Very fine, Tom. Thank you. How about yourself? Doing well, Father. It's great Good. to be here for another week it's with you. Good to see you. Uh, Father Francis has been very busy lately. He has uh, provided lots of material for us for tonight's program. Um, several, there's several topics that we wanted to get into. We had some uh, viewer questions related to these topics, but <clears throat> perhaps the first thing, Father, uh, that we could get into is this, uh, this new book that uh, is, is scheduled to be released today, actually uh, entitled God and the World to Come. Uh, Francis grants a, a book-length interview here. And, Father, there are... Um, so many, so many different uh, points that we could bring out uh, and, and through this, throughout this interview. But we, we printed off some of the uh, the more relevant ones that we'd like to discuss tonight. And so I would just like to go through some of these these quotes, Father, and uh, and hear your your reaction to them. Um, and this is this is in a question answer format. This interview that we we have uh, printed out here. And one of the the first questions the the interviewer asks Francis what urgencies he's per he, per he perceives in the world today. Uh, in the wake of the uh, coronavirus pandemic. And this is a quote from Francis. He says, We can no longer blithely accept inequalities and disruptions to the environment. The path to humanity's salvation passes through the creation of a new model of development, which unquestionably focuses on coexistence among peoples in harmony with creation. Father, how would you respond to this idea of Francis, where he says that the path to humanity's salvation passes through the creation of a new model of development? Do you find those words significant at all? Well, yes, he's just saying we, he's creating a new religion, a religion of the world. And humanity's salvation, you know, evidently has nothing to do with saving souls, right? It has nothing to do with uh, the next world. It's all about this world. And that is typical modernism and Freemasonry. Uh, someone asked uh, in the course of last week's show if uh, Francis was a, um, a Freemason, and I said he, he might be, but I doubt it, because the uh, Nubius and the permanent instruction of the Alta Medina said that the, 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 the Pope, according to their needs, right, who would think like them, should not be one of them because he could by a grace convert and then destroy the whole process of revolution. But Francis, I think, goes beyond Freemasonry. He's, he is uh, the Freemason's Freemason. He, he, he has uh, actually adopted a role here, or been thrust into a role, of paving the way for a religious uh, revolution, which will hail basically the one world religion, uh, the new world order will not be merely a, uh, a secular order. It, ha it has to be a religion. It has to involve a, a kind of faith or an anti-faith. It has to involve the Christ or an anti-Christ you know, figure. And uh, for that, uh, someone like Francis is necessary. He's predicted already, uh, forecast and prophesied in the book of the Apocalypse, and it would be more difficult to conceive of an individual who fit the description of the Apocalypse more perfectly than uh, Jorge Maria Bergoglio, right? than Francis. Um, by the way, also, he, uh, he responds to the first question by saying, no one can afford to rest easy. The world will never be the same again. Yeah. Right? The world will never be the same again. This is by decree now, by the, decree the, of Francis. The new saying. normal. We have to grasp new so these signs, okay? That's right. Um, and, you know, as you read this interview he gives, he's just rambling on and on and on and on. And on. it's a, it's a, you say, it's a, it's a book-length interview. He's using all of the revolutionary cliches about, uh, he, at one point he even says, even worse than suffering this crisis would be wasting the crisis. Well, right. you know the expression, yes. right? Yes. It's important not to waste a, a good crisis, right. a la... Uh, Rahm Emanuel and, uh, and Hillary Clinton, right? Yeah. And every revolutionary yep. <clears throat> since the French Revolution. So uh, he's fully invested in this, in this revolution. Exactly. Uh, but, but again, it has to take the form of a, of a new religion, 
which has the veneer of, of having a certain, uh, its roots in old religion, and yet at the same time reject, rejects the traditional religion. Mm -hmm. And Father, you talked about uh, how he, he mentioned wasting the, the crisis, and uh, you also mentioned the New World Order, and that was uh, kind of the real headline-grabbing quote where after the interviewer asks how we could waste this crisis, uh, what Francis meant by that. And Francis said that, that we could waste this crisis, quote, by closing in on ourselves. Instead, we need, or instead, we can heal in just... Even before that time, he does say that they must change lifestyles, li change the lifestyles of millions of people, especially children. They have to change their lifestyles. Now, talk about uh, tyranny. Talk about imposing a tyranny to change the lifestyles of millions of people. This is Bill Gates. This is George Soros we're talking about here. Uh, this is the cabal of these, uh, of these people. But Francis is the one who, who brings the, the... Well, he doesn't like clericalism, I know. But he's the one who brings a, a religious veneer to all of this, okay? A little sprinkling of uh, religion dust on it to make it look as though it's something very pious. <clears throat> but uh, actually, it's monstrous, and uh, it's tyrannical. It wants to change the lifestyles of millions of people, especially of children. In fact, they are doing that right now, right? Now, yeah. right? And um, the, uh, it's all about the earth. It's all about naturalism, you see. It's all about political choices, personal political choices, uh, with an um, economic green turn. So right. he wants to put, a, 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 again, a, 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 a green uh, cast over everything. With the, and again, what they mean by that simply is some radical economic new world order. Uh, you know, the, the former head of the Vatican Bank, um, Tedeschi, says uh, that it's really a, a false religion, what he calls Gnosticism, right? Uh, environmental Gnosticism, which is, again, the false religion of the New World Order. That's what he calls it. Do you, do you find it significant, Father, that he actually explicitly uses that terminology, the New World Order? We must have a New World Order. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, that, that really opens it up. He, he's just coming out and saying that, basically, we're not even going to try to hide it anymore. Everything that in the past has been announced as this wild conspiracy theory of these rather paranoid people, uh, it's all true, and uh, we, can, we can now come out and just unveil all of this to you because we know that we have the support and uh, we have the control, and we are going to move forward with you or without you. Mm -hmm. um, so I do consider this to be very significant that he's coming right out. Now remember, when when uh, Paul VI unveiled the new rite of Mass, he called it the new order of Mass. You know, I mean, if you have a rite, the Church has multiple rites, R-I-T-E-S, and she has Eastern rites, and then, the, of course, the Latin rite, the Roman rite. She has the Sarum rite of old, and she had the many Gallican rites. She has uh, the, uh, the Maronite rite, and she has the Coptic rite of Mass, and so on. So he wasn't just introducing a new rite of Mass. He said he was introducing a new order, a new order of Mass. And that is uh, basically something of an entirely different kind. That's the significance of the word, of, of a liturgy in the Church. So the, the new order has already come in to the Church. It was introduced in Vatican II and following Vatican II. So the new religious order has already been introduced. <coughs> Uh, it is in the process, a process of being completed right now by Francis. But uh, the, the new world order could not be put into effect until the new religious order had already been, uh, as it were, put into, into play. And now they're both going to be consummated together. The two of them, the new religious order and the new world order, have to come together to produce the, well, the, the realm of the Antichrist. Should anyone be surprised by this, Father? I, I remember some time ago doing a, a program uh, where speaking of, of Francis and how he, he desired this, this world police force, um, certainly something that would be in line with, with a new world right. order, but mm -hmm. also just his, his constant call for, um, I mean, essentially, effectively worldwide socialism. Uh, 
here in another quote from here is he he talks about uh, a fair distribution of resources and mm -hmm. um, should anyone be surprised by this, Father, or is this not perfectly in line with, with Francis's thinking? The only people who would be surprised by this are people who haven't been paying attention or have been uh, hearing but not understanding, and they don't know what socialism is, they don't know what communism is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but the idea of the redistribution of resources means compulsory, about making it compulsory. Uh, you know, taking from the, um, those who have, the bourgeoisie, as it were, right? the capitalists and uh, basically distributing the spoils, you know. Um, the, uh, the, the important thing to realize about this though is that he's actually suggesting this, more than suggesting, this has to be done uh, by putting economic pressure, it has to be done by a kind of force, it has to be applied. Right? Now in the past, uh, Paul, John Paul II right, and uh, Paul VI and John, and, and John XXIII before them talked about uh, instituting a world organization to impose a new economic order on the world. Right? Uh, John Paul II even said that it has to have certain teeth in the sense it has to be able to enforce, enforce nations to comply with its edicts uh, about the world economy. For, but Francis here is, is pointing out that we have to uh, refuse to allow companies that are not on board with this new plan. Uh, we have to uh, force them to comply by starving them, essentially. We have to uh, get people to stop supporting these and contributing to these companies that are not following this new model he has. He actually has a quote that says essentially exactly that, Father. If I could read it, he says, uh, in the state in which humanity finds itself, it is scandalous to continue financing industries that do not contribute to the inclusion of the excluded and the promotion of the least, and which penalize the common good by polluting creation. Mm -hmm. These are the four criteria for choosing which businesses to support. Inclusion of the excluded, promotion of the least, the common good, and care of creation. Before that, even just before that, he says, we will obtain the result of limiting support to companies that are harmful to the environment and to peace. We will obtain that result, right? Okay, so Francis is all on board to obtain that result of limiting support to these companies. And, and someone might ask, Father, who is this we that he speaks of? Well, he uses the plural, and I don't think that's the pontifical plural because he doesn't apply it anywhere else, right? No, no, he's talking about this cabal of billionaires, the club that he belongs to, right? The, the. Uh, Illuminati, call it what you want, you know, but, you know, uh, even, even this idea of rebuilding, we're going to rebuild, we're going to rebuild, well, again, it's the motto of the World Economic Forum, build back better. That's Biden's now uh, chosen motto to build back better. He uses the expression, we're going to rebuild now, we're going to rebuild and make things a lot better than they ever were. And we have to eradicate certain things, notably eradicate companies that are not supporting us in our change the world. We're going to change human nature, actually. We're going to change human nature. We are going to <clears throat> justify human nature from its crimes. We are going to sanctify human nature. So now human nature is virtuous. <clears throat> well, this is the work of Christ. This is the work of the Son of God made man, but not, not any longer. Now, now it's the work of Francis and his friends. We're going to do this. This is truly uh, messianic with a capital M-E-S-S. -S. <clears throat> and they are going to, well, he says, make the church a mess, and that's what he's done. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, by design. He wants to clear it out of the way, clear anything Catholic out of the way, leave nothing standing that is Catholic. I mean, you know, you, you saw just recently now, also in March, he's come out and he's effectively uh, pretty much not entirely banned, but the pre-traditional, I would say the Latin Mass, from, uh, from the Basilica. People were reacting to that. People were shocked by that. I was getting mass notifications about that. Oh, look, Francis just banned the extraordinary, the extraordinary form, form right. from the Basilica. And I'm thinking, well, yes, uh, is there, are there news there? Um, they're calling it extraordinary form, which means it really is tolerated only. So how long will that tolerance go on for? Because we know 
Francis actually hates, he loathes the traditional Mass. He loathes it. And uh, so we know that Francis's tolerance would, would grow thin after a while, and inevitably. But I think what they're, they're actually saying is that, well, Francis has finally made a move that was anticipated, but the fact that he's done it now is significant. And I think they're right about that. Uh, the fact that Francis now, in the last, just in the last couple of weeks, he's gone to Babylon. He's gone to the ziggurat of Babylon. I mean, the, the, the Tower of Babel, right? He's paid his respects to the Tower of Babel, <clears throat> where mankind said, we're going to mount up to heaven and seize it for ourselves, right? Well, what could be more emblematic of Francis himself, right? He goes there to make peace with uh, the world, basically. And he does, uh, in his own way, by completely capitulating to the world there, uh, notably the Muslims. And uh, so it's very signif significant that he goes to Babylon and uh, I think he even participates in some kind of strange worship there. There's a certain rite that doesn't even have a, a, the consecration as part of it. We talked about that before. It's, it's, it's a certain uh, peculiar Chaldean rite, as I recall that doesn't even have the consecration as part of the ceremony. I think Francis actually took part in that, and that was taken. So, but all of this is very symbolic. He starts March that way, and, and lo and behold, I mean, <clears throat> what time of year was it that he brought the Pashamamas into the town? Into the when, uh, <clears throat> when did Rome have its Moloch statue set up outside the, the uh, Colosseum, right? It was this time of year. Right. Uh, and then Francis followed it up almost immediately with his Pachamamas. So, uh, as I recall, so, you know, this seems to be prime time for Francis during the year to unveil uh, some uh, great new leap forward for his new world order. And the fact that he's come out and just explicitly announced it, that now we're going to drive to make it a reality, I think is very significant that he believes <clears throat> with the accession of Uncle Joe, uh, Stalin. I, when I say Stalin, I mean the uh, man of steel. You know, Joseph Stalin was referred to as Uncle Joe because he was so folksy and friendly and so on, even though he was murderous, you know, and vicious and cruel behind the scenes. He just had the veneer and the persona of being Uncle Joe. That's how they was referred to. Um, and the man of steel. And I would refer that also to, uh, to Uncle Joe Biden, but I, I wouldn't spell steel the same way, though. <clears throat> but uh, now, that, now that he has this ally in the White House, I think Francis realizes that a major step has been taken forward to move forward on the New World Order, and it is Francis who is unveiling, is now, is now getting ready to unveil this New World Order. Father, another topic in this interview is um, is the topic of, of arms. He says Francis says that it's it is no longer tolerable to continue to manufacture and traffic in arms. And this is the this is the the first thing that Francis says when the interviewer asks him concretely where might we begin uh, to to improve the world uh, post post pandemic. And why would this be the very first thing that Francis says? Um, it is no longer tolerable to continue to manufacture and traffic in arms. Why, why the emphasis on that? Well, uh, because arms are destructive, of course, but they also enable a person to defend himself against tyranny. And so, uh, again, this comes at a time just when uh, Uncle Joe is about to launch a major uh, offensive against armaments in America, privately owned armaments, that only the government is allowed to have arms which is very much antithetical to the very concept of our country, right? Uh, to, the, to, the, to the understanding of our founding fathers, that the people needed arms, and they needed arms not only to protect themselves against uh, enemies foreign, but also enemies domestic, including the government and tyranny, right? They're very sensitive to that, you might say. And so the idea of uh, scrapping armaments, except those in the hands of the overlords of the New World Order, is a very important part of this and harmonizes perfectly with the program in Washington, D.C. now with this shadow government of Uncle Joe Stalin, uh, a shadow government which many think is actually being directed by Barack Obama from behind the scenes. 
Uh, and the push is coming is going to come to uh, confiscate the arms of the people and to render them helpless to resist. It's the next step. They're just wondering how to go about it um, very carefully because they don't want to provoke a reaction they can't control. <clears throat> so I, I actually think it has a lot to do with that. Uh, this pacifistic mentality that is emanating from uh, the Vatican right now, I think is meant to uh, be kind of the large religious principle that is going to uh, back up the policies of uh, Uncle Joe in Washington, D.C. and his handlers. You know. mm -hmm. um, notice that uh, Francis talks about being united in fraternity. Over and over again, he cites that. And so I can understand why our uh, writer of last week asked, is he a Freemason? Because his themes are constant Freemasonry. Uh, liberty, equality, right? <clears throat> equality and fraternity. Over and over and over again, right? This is the, 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 the leftist mantra. And when they, one might be confused by that because equality, yes, that sounds like a leftist uh, byword now. And fraternity, definitely, that's a leftist byword. But liberty, but you have to remember, the liberty that the left proposes, the liberty of the French Revolution, is actually liberty from God. That's what they really meant by that. We are at liberty from God. We're at liberty from religion. We're at liberty from faith. We're at liberty from church. That's what it means to set mankind free for these people. So when they say liberty, equality, and fraternity, that's what they mean. They mean a society of human beings without God, with no God but themselves, really. The initial temptation to Eve, right? You defy God, and you will be as gods yourself, knowing good and evil. Mm -hmm. You decide. Well, Father, do you think that uh, right after he talks about the, the arms here, the, um, the manufacture of arms, that the next question is, is in regards to, to women, the interviewer? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the, the, He's pandering to them. Yes, the, the question that he poses here, women continue to bear the weight of all recessions. What do you think about this topic? <laughs> and uh, Francis yeah. goes through um, essentially just, just preaching the, the leftist line that, that we hear so often yeah. how, how women need to. He's pandering, pandering to women. Equal pay for... for and there are many women this. who would, you know, fall for this, but many women would not. Many women see right through this. Many women are too intelligent and too virtuous to fall victim to pandering like this. Just as there are many women in America who, who realize when they're being pandered to by the left, and they're offended by it. Um, um, but, but there are those um, who hate their lot in life as women, and uh, they enjoy being pandered to. Um, so, unfortunately, again, uh, you have to recall, though, Tom, that all leftists uh, make their hay, as it were, by setting groups against each other. And they've got to divide. They've got to divide the population of societies to weaken them and to make them incapable of resisting because they're too busy uh, exhausting themselves fighting each other. And you've got to turn the old against the young, the children against their parents, of course, You've got to turn women against men. You've got to turn races against each other. This is the old formula for divide and conquer. And so, you know, this constant, again, pandering is to try to say, you are the victims. You are the victims. You are the victims of these people. You're the victims of these white people. You are the victims of these men. You are the victims of, of uh, these older, uh, you know, uh, conservative types, you know, who are trying to impose their values on you. <laughs> Not to mention the older, the leftists are certainly uh, up there. <laughs> right? um, and uh, so I, I consider that to be, again, uh, just an effort to uh, sow a certain resentment. Mm -hmm. Father, he, Francis actually has a section in here concerning uh, parents and and uh, children and their relationship. It's one of the one of the final questions. But um, 
it seems, Father, maybe on the surface that he's not intending to show any any uh, discontentment there, or any kind of uh, warfare between parents and children, because he, he talks a lot uh, about the importance of parents playing with their children and how important that is and how they could even uh, have a, a schedule to uh, to kind of schedule some play dates and to, to, to really focus on the importance of playing parents playing with their children. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with that, Father? There's nothing wrong with that at all. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, you know, this whole this whole scenario here that he's painting is in 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 the realm of the pandemic, right? Yes. Okay. We have to realize that the stage here on which he's pre presenting this whole formula for a new world order is the pandemic. The background is the pandemic, right? And what has happened during the pandemic? What has happened to men, their jobs, their work? What has happened to them? Gone. They've been locked at home, yeah. right? So actually, this is a good place for them to be. Is it bad for men to be involved in the lives of their children? No. Is it bad for them to be there uh, involved in the lives of their wives? No, it's not bad, although there are many there have been, there's been a spike in violence at home and even child abuse at home because the men are getting nervous about this whole thing. How do I provide for my family? You know, it's getting on their nerves and understandably so. But throughout this whole thing, a message, a drumbeat has been going out. Enjoy your time at home. Enjoy your time there. Okay, just accept it. So what are they doing? They're turning in Netflix and watching all these evil movies, right? Or the, uh, the consumption of alcohol has gone sky high, yes. right? But the message is, don't be upset that you can't be at work, that your business are closed, that your business is failing. Enjoy your time at home. And so uh, it is not, uh, in my mind, uh, out of reach to think that this, this is part of that whole mentality, you know? Um, Again, you know, the idea of the men being out and working in the workforce and earning money and supporting their families is anathema to the liberals, okay? It is actually a, the women and the men who should do, handle the workforce and um, they should, uh, uh, you know, it, it, they don't have particular roles, des roles designed by God, but their roles are basically designed by society, okay? And uh, I, I, I see this, all of the, the, the formulas that the, that the liberals present here are all thought out, and they all have the same goal in mind, okay? Now, you might think, okay, the parents having playdates with their kids, that's a wonderful thing, that's in favor of the family, et cetera, et cetera, okay? But I also see in the larger picture, I see uh, what they've done to the family, what they have actually, the liberals and the leftists have actually done to the family by this pandemic and all the rest. And how they're actually working to change the very nature of the family. And uh, they, have an, they have an ultimate goal to this. And uh, I, I, I can't separate their advice, even when on the surface of it, it looks very wholesome from the overall picture of what they've actually been doing to the families. And Francis is one of them. Yeah. So maybe he just thinks it would be a very nice thing for uh, parents to play with their kids. Maybe he does think that way. Mm -hmm. But in the overall picture of this pandemic, of which he is a major figure and plays a major part, I can't help but see uh, something uh, a little more behind it. Yeah. I, I thought it was uh, interesting to point out too, Father. I, I, I believe that that uh, question, his answer, his response to it was one of the longest ones um, to any of the questions. And not once in there does he mention anything about prayer or, or virtue or religion or God or anything mm -hmm. supernatural whatsoever. Well, but, um, that's a very good point. Huh? One, yeah, pray with your families. No, yeah. Nothing yeah, there. Yeah. But the uh, the very last question that we have in our printout, Father, the uh, the interviewer asks asked Francis what he would like to say to the quote COVID generations. Uh, speaking of young people and the uh, mm -hmm. the uh, the issues which they're the facing COVID today, generation. the COVID okay, generations. Yeah. Yes, I, I've heard them referred to as the COVIDians. The COVIDians, huh? a real cult. Yeah. The COVIDians, yeah. the branch COVIDians. Yeah. 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 Uh, there are actually those in academia who are referring to the COVIDians now. Oh. As though they're actually 
a cultic group now mm -hmm. in the history of mankind. Yeah. Well, li listen to, uh, to Francis's words of advice for them, Father. He says, I encourage them not to give in to the economic downturn, to not stop daydreaming. Don't be afraid to dream big. By working for their dreams, they can protect them from those who want to take them away from them. Pessimists, dishonest people, and profiteers. Perhaps never before, as in this third millennium, have younger generations paid the, higher pri the highest price for economic labor, health, and moral crisis. Uh, feeling sorry for ourselves leads nowhere. <laughs> he goes on and on and on, Father. But just how incredibly shallow is this? And how silly talking about how young people need to dream and dream big and continue to daydream and don't let anyone take their dreams away from them. How is this? What does this have to do with the Catholic religion? Exactly. What does it have to do with our Lord? Exactly. What does it have to do with our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, actually, he gets to that, Tom, and it's just after what you read here. Yes. Here's what he says here. You pointed this out earlier, I think. God made man capable and eager to know and to work and to love. Quote, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He cites actually something from scripture. Yes. Astounding. Then he comments on it. There is no commandment more important than this one. Jesus says to the disciples, St. Mark chapter 12, verse 31. Now, again, here's where our Lord says there are the two great commandments, the first and the second. The first is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, thy whole mind, thy whole soul, thy whole strength, right? To love God with all of your powers of loving. Thou shalt do this. And our Lord says that the second is like to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Francis, in citing that reference, Mark 12, 31, actually cites the second great commandment and then says there is no commandment more important than this one. What is, what is the thought behind that? Does this make sense? It's, 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 it's a flat contradiction yes. between the words of our Lord himself that precede this and Francis's own assessment of it. That it's, it's an the love of neighbor is the most important yes. commandment of all. It's, it's an entirely new religion, Father. This, mm -hmm. a, this is, a, a, this is the, the worship of mankind. This is literally the, the worship of, man. of yeah. mankind. Mm -hmm. that, that is the, the, the religion of the Antichrist, yeah. is it not? Well, certainly. That's what, they're, that's what they're forming right now. Yeah. And Francis is really spearheading it. I mean, Joe Biden, being supposedly a devout Catholic, um, at any other time in the world's history, that would be, um, well, it would, it would be just a sad, you know, attempted comedy. But with Francis now in the Vatican, uh, one can say that and be taken seriously. Um, because when one asks the question now, is the Pope Catholic? The question, the answer is, well, evidently not. Manifestly not. Manifestly not. So, <laughs> but this is what we're dealing with here. This is why I see in Francis the fulfillment of uh, the book of the Apocalypse referring to the, uh, the uh, second uh, beast, the false prophet, paving the way for the new world order. Really. Yeah. And uh, I think when Francis speaks more and more, uh, uh, this, this true alliance between um, uh, Francis in the Vatican and uh, Washington, D.C. now and the powers that have seized D.C. and have armed themselves to the teeth, you know, they're uh, not the border, but they, they, they've made the wall and the troops around Washington, D.C., not at the borders of the country. Um, I, I see that as a very ominous development in the direction of really apocalyptic times. Mm -hmm. Well, at least Father uh, Francis ends this interview with a, a nice uh, quote from a traditional Catholic saint, St. Philip Neri, where he says, uh, don't forget to be cheerful as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So isn't that, isn't that a very nice little, little ending point for us? Uh, well, that's, but, uh, well, you see, this, uh, it, it all s sounds good. I mean, even, even the idea of, you know, parents play with your children. Sure. I mean, uh, it, it, it's not as though that's something new, you know. I mean, the Catholic Church for years has been trying to build strong families. And it's the left that try, is trying to destroy the family. Yeah. So, um, but again, I mean, you know, uh, to build up the, um, 
the role of the, the father and the role of the mother and the God-given responsibilities they have is really is something that is, is really quintessentially Catholic. And that is precisely what is being dismantled now. Exactly. Um, exactly. So... I mean, even appealing to the women, saying, you're the ones who are the principal victims of all of this present world order. I mean, you're the ones who are suffering with this present world order. It's like appealing to them. I mean, you're the ones who should be the revolutionaries and leading the way and establishing this new world order to escape this slavery that you've been enduring, right? Uh, so uh, it's a revolutionary document. It's meant to be. Yeah. And no one could take it any other way, I think, except the most naive. Yes. Well, Father, something else that uh, we wanted to get into tonight, we, we had a, a viewer ask about this. Uh, um, this was from uh, March 15th. Uh, this, the Vatican uh, statement on marriage, um, the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, they issued a, a response saying that uh, the Church does not have the power to bless same-sex unions or relations that involve sexual activity outside of marriage. This seems very uh, Catholic. Father, one of our viewers asked if, uh, because of this this proclamation now, does does this mean that Francis and the Vatican are Catholic? Saying something like this? All right. Uh, I guess we received a like, communication. We don't know if somebody's being facetious or not. Saying, <laughs> well, does this mean that that the Vatican is Catholic, in that they are now saying this is the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, yeah. saying that uh, these are sinful relationships and therefore God cannot bless sin. Right. right? Uh, to what extent did that come from Francis? I, I don't know, I, but uh, he might he might have. I believe that he, he approved this after the Congregation okay. of Doctrine of Faith. It's very possible. It yeah. Does it make one Catholic? Well, I mean, uh, there are many uh, evangelical Christian groups out there that would say this: that God cannot bless these sex, these sinful unions, right? Does that make them all Catholic? This one thing, does this one idea make them all Catholic? Well, manifestly not. There's much more to being Catholic than just acknowledging the natural law, right? right. So clearly, no, this does not make one Catholic if they reject the Mass and, and the sacraments and, you know, and all the rest. Um, so, uh, but... The, the, even, even this latest statement, though, you have to understand, we're, we're listening to modernists here who give with one hand and take with the other. Okay? So in practice, when they, when they say that, no, you cannot bless these same-sex unions because they are sinful, but then when they allow the clergy to do that, okay, right. and they w give a wink of the eye to that, you know, and let that happen, and there are no penalties, but rather those who are promoting this are themselves promoted into positions of power. What does that tell you? I mean, talk really is cheap with the modernists, and it's what they do. And this is how it is with leftists. Leftists would be very, very happy with someone who would actually, uh, you know, s say some uh, w words against abortion, but then get into power and promote abortion with everything they do and all their votes. Because leftists don't just go with words, they go with actions. They say, okay, what does this person actually do? Um, and, and they realize that words can be used very deceptively to promote the leftist cause. And so it is with the modernists, too. So when I hear this coming from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, I say, well, okay, maybe there is somebody at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith who's more conservative um, in his you know, social beliefs or whatever, but, uh, in fact, it, it's not going to have the, any practical effect, quite contrary, because those who are actually promoting same-sex unions and blessing same-sex unions are the ones who are going to be favored by Francis in practice. And, uh, in fact, Joseph Biden, right, uh, is, has openly favored these things, at first, he was he voting in favor of the Defense of Marriage Act when it first came out, and then he changed his tune with, with Obama later, right? And was in favor of redefining marriage. But you see, we're being told now by his spokesperson that he is a devout Catholic, of course. 
And uh, Francis, no doubt, played a big role in getting Joseph Biden where he is right now and having him in that position right now uh, in this country. And uh, they are really allies. And there's no doubt about it that Biden and Francis are allies in their beliefs. So, I mean, let the congregation for the doctrine of the faith say what they want from one day to the next or from a year to the next and say, no, it's wrong, God can't bless these things. But the practical effect is what really matters here. Uh, this might pacify some more conservatives and have them saying, oh, look, the Vatican must be Catholic after all. Francis must be Catholic after all. <clears throat> but the fact is, it's a smokescreen. It is a smokescreen. <clears throat> and someone might say, well, Father Jenkins, come on, you know, give them some credit. I say, all I'm asking you to do <clears throat> is listen to St. Pius X. Not, don't listen to me. Listen to St. Pius X, read what he says in Pashendi about modernists and how they operate. And you'll see very clearly how this has happened. Over the years, we've had conservative voices come out and say things like this, and they just get steamrolled right over. And uh, they become mulch <laughs> for, the, uh, for the, uh, the New World Order that's on its way and for, with Francis. So, <clears throat> no, I, I think this is just basically tossing a bone to the... Start thinking, well, gee, maybe there's something really wrong. <clears throat> and then somebody will say something, uh, a nice word about Latin. Or who knows, you know, and then, and then they'll think, oh, okay, well, it's, it's okay then. Mm -hmm. All is well. And Father, I think this perhaps might, uh, if we could step back and take a look at this objectively, I think this might be just another example, another illustration of how incredibly far we have fallen. I, I'll, mm -hmm. I always remember um, with, with, I believe it was Benedict XVI, how he at, at one point um, referenced the, the Holy Eucharist, and he used that, that adjective holy, the mm -hmm. Holy Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And there were so many traditional Catholics, well, some traditional Catholics, but, but many conservative uh, Nova Sordo types who who were just totally um, just awestruck mm -hmm. at this and said, "Oh, isn't this wonderful? This is so. This mm -hmm. is great. This is amazing." The the Holy Father said the Holy Eucharist. Wow. <laughs> how Father? How incredibly sad. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, well, it's Tom, sad. you're absolutely right. I mean, the very fact that the question of blessing same-sex unions unions could come before the congregation for the doctrine of the faith and be an actual question yes. at all. The fact that there's any. <laughs> any possibility of eventually thinking about, you know, it, it just, it's outrageous. And then on top of that, the fact that there were people who would say, oh, look, they said it's wrong. And they, they, they get excited because they say the congregation for the doctor, they actually said this was sinful and that they can't bless these things. And they, they think it's time to pop the champagne corks over that and celebrate. It, you're right, Tom. I mean, it, it really is a gauge of just how corrupt things have become. Now, you know, this all sounds very negative, and frankly it is, <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> but unfortunately it's true, you know, and facing the reality, I mean, if there's anyone who faced reality, who knew reality, it was our Lord. Read the Gospels. I mean, one might say that they are very negative <laughs> in their approach, but when our Lord had come to sacrifice himself for our sins to justify us, and was continually, uh, you know, encountering our weakness and our frailties and our perfidy. Um, you know, uh, well, what, does, what would one expect, you know? Uh, the good news doesn't come from us, although Francis wants to pretend that the, the, this, this paradise on earth is going to come from us and we're going to create this new world order. But the fact is, the gospel makes it very clear that uh, there's no way back to paradise, and certainly it's not up to us to build it for ourselves. We uh, ruined the paradise we had by wanting to make it our own and do it our way in the first place. And so this, the new world order is, is that decision on, on steroids, as they say, right? It's like the, the, the last adamant response of mankind to the temptation of the devil, of, of Lucifer in the garden, saying, we will do it our way and we will have our paradise and it will be of our own devising. Uh, and we don't need you, so we'll be our own gods. And, uh, but in, in any case, we see the power of grace in all this. And we see that God would not permit this to happen, but for the fact that more souls will be saved. 
that more souls will be saved and will be in heaven because of this. And greater saints, greater saints will be in heaven because of this. And it's the only reason why God permits this. It's the only reason why he tolerates it. Because he can outdo by grace what we do by sin. Anything we do by sin, he will outdo by grace. And uh, so going forward, uh, although we have certain trepidations about this, but trepidations like St. Thomas Moorhead, wondering, well, will I be faithful? Will I be faithful? That was his only concern in the trials that he faced. And when he found that he was faithful and he wasn't going to, at least at, at that, up to that point, he knew that he hadn't uh, succumbed to the pressure. He was filled with joy. He was overjoyed to know that he would, could withstand the pressure by the grace of God. And uh, no matter what else lay before him, that he would not turn his back on God. He would not be uh, uh, like Peter, right, <laughs> denying our Lord. That gave him great, great joy. And so this is something that each and every one of us should, should take to heart. And that is that God is going to provide the graces for us to be faithful. And it's going to require a great deal of, of us, certainly, but it will, it will also be supported by the great graces we need. People tend to be a little nervous when they say, well, I don't know if I could withstand that pressure. I don't know I could, I could face that uh, sacrifice and that hardship. And the answer is, well, of course you don't know, because you're not there yet. You're not facing it. The graces aren't there yet. But one thing you do know for a fact is that when you are confronted with this, the graces will be there. And you will just have to resolve right now that you are going to be faithful to them, that you are going to cooperate with the graces. Then... And the best way to ensure that is by cooperating with the graces now. Cooperating with the graces that God is giving you right now. And that's the best guarantee, if there is such a thing, reassurance you have that you will cooperate with the graces then. And uh, what more could one hope for, really? What more could one ask God for than that? So, um, you know, when we, when we look at this whole situation here, we realize that, that there are obligations we have now uh, to, our, to the church, to our country, to our families. <clears throat> and uh, we have to live up to those right now, to the best of our ability. Of course, made possible by the grace of God. And that's the key to all good things. Prime example, St. Patrick, right? Tomorrow is St. Patrick's Feast Day. That's right. yes. Here was a man who came originally to a country, he came as a slave. He was a young man who was enslaved right? to a pagan chieftain. <clears throat> St. Francis made his escape for one reason. St. Patrick. St. Patrick, thank you. I'm not talking about, yeah, getting mixed up <laughs> with the wrong friends here. Uh, he made his escape for, the, for one reason, and that is with the intention to come back to them as a priest, to come back to them as a missionary, to bring them to our Lord Jesus Christ. He would return to them, now in a different capacity. And you might say, <clears throat> okay, he, he left as a slave, he returned as a priest and even a bishop. But as a priest and a bishop, he was more their slave than he had been when he had been enslaved. Because now he had given his entire life, he devoted his entire life to their salvation. Um, and so when we read in St. Paul's epistles about our Lord emptying himself, taking the form of a slave, well, you know, he's speaking quite literally there that he actually did. He emptied himself out, as it were, taking the form of a slave. And our Lord came to us absolutely devoted to the purpose of his Father, our justification, our salvation, our sanctification, our salvation, our glorification in heaven. This was his mission here on earth. And he was absolutely devoted to that. And so when St. Patrick returned to Ireland, he returned with that very mind in him, that he was totally devoted his entire life, every waking moment, uh, would be devoted to that cause. And you see, he, he saw the sacrifice that would be needed and when people read about the sacrifices, the physical and mental sacrifices <coughs> that St. Francis, that's, I'm sorry, here I go again, that St. Patrick endured, <coughs> you know, sometimes people look at it today and say that was terribly excessive. 
You know, why would he do that? And the answer is simply because he knew the need to generate grace by sacrifice, that grace had to be generated by sacrifice as an act of love. And so he undertook these amazing sacrifices, but he did it out of love for these souls to obtain the graces that were needed to move them uh, from their pagan hopelessness and savagery to... Uh, to actually love for God and, and love for each other, first and second great commandments. Um, and we see how success, successful he was because he was wholehearted about it in his love for God, in his love for souls. This is the kind of uh, greatness that God needs, as it were, I mean, that God works through right now. And we need a St. Patrick right now. We need a St. Patrick in the United States of America. We need a St. Patrick in the world. We need a, a cure of ours, uh, St. John Vianney. And the devil said if there were two others like him, if there were three of them like him in the world, his Satan's kingdom would be at an end, right? Now, that's quite an admission, <laughs> how fragile Satan's kingdom really is. It's also quite an admission that there were not three priests like St. John Vianney, which is also the other side of the question, sad to say. But uh, the fact is there can be, by the grace of God. It's a matter of cooperation with his grace. So uh, on this Feast of St. Patrick coming up tomorrow, see Feast of St. Joseph two days later, um, and just the, the whole period of Lent now. We've come to the midpoint. We're looking forward to Easter Sunday. We have to redouble our dedication to our faith, redouble our dedication to our Lord, to his church, practice the traditional Catholic faith without compromise, without compromise. And, uh, and um, the, the, the key, as St. Paul says, is to be faithful, be found faithful by Christ, right? That's what we have to aspire to. Absolutely. Father, thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate all your time. Appreciate all of your uh, wisdom and insight here. And, well, uh, God bless Tom, you. Thank you. I hope some of it was insightful and wise. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> with the grace of God. Absolutely. God, God bless, bless you, you all. Yeah. And by the way, uh, we should also thank our supporters, our prayers, yes. and also our financial supporters. Great help. We yes. appreciate the sacrifices absolutely. you make. Absolutely. Yep. Thanks to all of our viewers for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you and God bless you.